Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Trial Site News podcast series. I'm Erin, your host, and today we have Dr. Christy Huff joining us. She is a cardiologist and she is a director of the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. Dr. Huff, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Erin. Yeah. And the last time we spoke, we I did a podcast with Christy, because she has a really interesting story. It was, must've been three years ago or two years ago. Yeah. I think it was 2018. Time right when, that was right when I was uh, on causes or cures when I was just starting my own podcast and yeah, uh, yeah it was, um, but your story still gets so much attention and uh, is helping lots of people. Um, so we're going to talk about the coalition, the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition and what you guys are doing but you have such a compelling personal story. So I thought maybe we can start there um, because this really all ties into how you got involved with the coalition is your personal experience. So I thought maybe we can go back to 2015 and just, you know, you just share your story. Sure. So um, my experience with benzodiazepines um, you know, but I had taken it off and on for years just for flying, just one dose at a time. But I started taking it um, in 2015. It was prescribed by my doctor, and I was taking it to deal with a, a health crisis that I was experiencing, like with, which which was hopefully you know a temporary thing. It was severe dry eye sy- syndrome, and it was extremely painful, and I couldn't sleep, and also there was a bit of anxiety associated with the situation. So I was taking it a small dose of Xanax 0.25 milligrams just at night to sleep. And it was just meant to get me through until we could figure out what was going with on with the eyes. And, um, after about three weeks of taking the Xanax nightly, I started to develop some really strange symptoms. I, um, began to have a tremor during the day and also some, um, new anxiety, um, that I had never really experienced. And, um, I went to my doctors and they tried to, we thought maybe the tremor was some kind of a neurological, um, problem. And so I underwent extensive evaluation. Um, and we were trying to tie that in with the dry eyes and maybe it was a rheumatological condition. And so I had tons of tests. I had a MRI spinal tips, everything came back normal. Um, and after everything came back normal, my doctors just sort of wrote off these symptoms as um, anxiety. Well, unfortunately, my symptoms continued to grow worse and worse. And it got to the point where a couple of hours after taking a dose of Xanax, I would um, have a, you know, a tremor, I couldn't breathe, it was like an elephant was sitting on my chest, my muscles would tighten up. And what was happening in hindsight, I was experiencing inner dose withdrawal. And that means the Xanax was only lasting a couple of hours, and then my body was in withdrawal. So by this time I had become physically dependent. Um, and so I ended up, um, actually just Googling it because I wasn't getting any answers from my doctors. Nobody really suggested that the medication could be a problem. And I found the website Benzo buddies, just, you know, searching around one night on the internet. And what I read there was shocking. There was, you know, tens of thousands of patients who were having very similar experiences to my own. And, you know, the light bulb just really went off there. Like I had become dependent on the Xanax and I needed to figure out a way to get off of it. And, you know, on that website also, I read about the Ashton manual. Um, Heather Ashton is a British psychopharmacologist who in the eighties and nineties, she supervised patients at a clinic coming off of benzodiazepines. And she wrote up her experiences in the Ashton manual. And it's, it's got protocols for coming off medication or coming off the benzodiazepine medication. Mm -hmm. So, um, I took this information. Go ahead. Oh yeah. I was going to say, I took this information back to my doctors and, um, they first, nobody really believed that that was going on because they just said, well, you've been only on the Xanax for a few weeks. It's just such a low dose. That can't be your problem. And, you know, again, I continued to grow worse and worse. Um, finally, fortunately, I, took the man manual to a psychiatrist in town and, you know, he f- looked at what was going on and listened to me and, you know, he believed that that was the problem. And so based on that protocol in the manual, we switched over to Valium, which has a longer half-life than Xanax. 
And that took care of those interdose withdrawal symptoms I was having, but then I was still faced with tapering off of the, um, the Valium. And so that took me over three years to do that because, you know, I have a, a young daughter and I needed mm-hmm. to be really functional for her. Um, can we so stop there? Um, Christy and I find, you know, it's interesting because you had to find that information on your own, which can be yeah. really frustrating, I'm sure. And, um, when you finally found someone, a doctor who could help you with this, this is where we get into the tapering, right? Right. Okay. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? What that was like? I, I read, uh, in your, one of your blogs on your site and you were a great writer, by the way, I read, um, that it took you three years, which I didn't realize it was that long to be completely done. Yeah. Yeah. So once I got switched over, it took me six to eight weeks to transition over from the Xanax to the Valium. And then once I was fully transitioned to Valium, it took, it was exactly three years, two months and 10 days, I believe, but who's counting. Uh, But it was, it was, it was a very long process. So I did, I was diagnosed with breast cancer during the middle of the taper. And so I had to hold a couple of months, hold my dose during, you know, surgery. So that delayed me a little bit, but, uh, you know, even if I hadn't had that, it would still would have been a multi-year process. Um, and despite me going slow, it was, I mean, I, I counted up to 80 different symptoms that I experienced. Um, Right. I saw that. And that's still that not, that number just blows my mind. That's a lot. I know it was a lot and it wasn't just a laundry Um, list of symptoms. It was the fact that it was just so utterly disabling. I mean, this affected my daily life and towards the latter half of the taper, I became more and more um, bed bound. Um, You know, there was just days I couldn't, I couldn't even hardly leave my room. And so it was, it was just really hard to manage a life, especially that, you know, I'm a mom with the child. So, I mean, I had to have a lot of help during that time. And if you want, you don't have to, but do you mind sharing some of the things you experienced d- during oh, this? Yeah. Um, so I would say one of my worst symptoms was this, um, chemical terror is how I describe it because I mean, there there's anxiety and then there was this next level terror. It's almost like you were in constant fight or flight, like a, like a bear was about to eat you. And it was just completely incapacitating. Um, I mean, my heart rate would shoot up all the time. I, I ended up towards the end of my taper, I developed POTS or pustural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. You know, some of the long COVID patients are actually experiencing um, that as well. Um, but it's where your heart rate, you, you have basically dysautonomia, your nervous system is, function, is um, affected and your heart rate shoots up and when you stand up and you're so dizzy, I mean, I couldn't even stand for more than a few seconds towards the end of my taper, you know, and I have symptoms of blood pooling in my leg. My legs were purple and, um, my feet would just felt kind of like these cold blocks of ice. It was just awful. And then that's just, you know, that's just a few of the symptoms, but my cognitive function was extremely affected. So I had a hard time, um, forming memories or using the computer. I had a hard time just um, following a recipe to cook. Um, I love that part in your blog, not loved it, but when you said you were forgetting to put the flour in the peach cobbler and, yeah, yeah, and it makes yeah. a good ice cream topping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I do was- that all the time, but I, <laughs> I probably have some cognitive issue, but um, well, no, I usually put, I switch the salt and the, and the sugar and use the salt in the brownies instead of the sugar, which goes over really well. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a decent cook and I had been cooking for years, but it just kind of, and there was this period of time when the taper was done where I was starting to try to do things again. And then I was just failing so miserably because I just couldn't read all the directions and just get it all right. And, yeah. you know, I ended up struggling with that. And, you know, finally it just got better. And, you know, I'm able to to cook a cobbler again with all the ingredients, thankfully. I mean, that had to have been so frustrating. Yeah, it really was. And I had to learn a lot of patience with this because I mean, there was just things that my brain and body could not do, um, during, you know, several year time period. And it was, yeah, it was, I had to relearn a lot of things. So you, you finished the taper 
and you no more benzodiazepines, you're, you're, you're done. And then uh, I, you wrote about how there was this year after that and everything wasn't perfect or peachy, so to speak, right? There was things that happened during that year. There was still healing going on. Can you describe that? What was that period like when you were finally done taking the benzos? Yeah. So uh, March 15th will mark my three years off benzodiazepines. So I have a lot of, you know, perspective, I guess um, at this point. So I would say at the end of my taper, my body and my brain were in utter wreck. I mean, there was, there was a huge amount of recovery that I had to, to, um, go through. And so I actually enlisted the help of, uh, I got a new primary care physician and she checked a lot of lab work and I had, you know, quite a few vitamin deficiencies like vitamin D and vitamin B. And, and so we corrected all those issues and I was referred to physical therapy, uh, because I had a lot of just muscle weakness, um, First, I think from the damage caused by the drug and also just the fact that I was, I was laying around in bed for a while. And so I had to, um, work back my, my stamina and I went from barely being able to walk to, um, over the course of the year, I was finally able to take my daughter to Disney year, Disneyland off at that one year mark. So I was able to walk around the, the park. So I, you know, I made a huge amount of recovery in that span of a year. Um, and then, you know, we were talked about the, like the cooking, I was just getting back to trying to do my normal activities, like cooking for my family and, um, doing the shopping and things like that. And, it, you know, my house had become a wreck in that three-year period because, uh, you know, nobody really was managing our affairs while I was sick. And so I just had to, had to start taking little projects, little organizational projects and, just try to get our life back on order again. So it was a, a huge process of recovery. And honestly, three years later, um, you know, I'm still working um, on some aspects of my recovery. So you took the benzodiazepine as prescribed and this wasn't on your, what you experienced wasn't on your radar when you were first prescribed it. Is that fair to say? Oh, definitely. So um, like I said, I had been prescribed it for flying for years and only had taken one dose just to fly. And then, you know, when, um, I had this eye crisis, my primary doctor encouraged me to take it, um, uh, to help, kind of help deal with the situation. And, you know, we both thought it was going to be temporary. I don't think either of us thought that these horrible adverse effects, um, were going to happen. And, you know, looking back at my training in medical school, I had never, um, you know, we had been taught about the addiction aspect of benzodiazepines, but not necessarily um, physical dependence, which is different. I mean, you can, your body can be become dependent on the drug, just taking it as prescribed and, you know, not just the physical dependence, um, but the fact that it can be so incredibly difficult to taper off of it. Because, you know, I thought, okay, I'm dependent, no big deal. I'll just taper off at a few months and I'll just slowly reduce the dose. Well, you know, it didn't turn out to be quite that simple. It was just, mm -hmm. I was basically reducing it by these microscopic mm -hmm. doses and suffering, you know, horrible symptoms all the way down. Right. Now, um, on, on the site, the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, uh, there's a lot of information on there. But one thing that is stressed is the importance of language um, when you talk about addiction versus chemical dependence. And I think you said, even in your experience, people will just refer to you as someone who was addicted, which wasn't the case. Can you talk about that? Why is that language distinction so important? Yeah, so it's mainly important just because of how we um, treat patients that are experiencing just um, physical dependence alone, because, you know, someone with addiction, you might send them to a detox center or a rehab. And, um, a lot of those places just pull people off the medication extremely quickly. And that can lead to all sorts of, you know, damage, neurological problems. We see a lot of people in our organization that have, you know, they've been disabled because they, they went to detox and were taken off the medication really quickly. Um, so people that just have pure physical dependence, it would be better for them to have a slow supervised, you know, flexible taper off the medication. And, uh, for anybody listening, 
tapering is really a, a serious thing. So don't try to do this on your own. I, I think Dr. Huff can speak more to that if someone if someone out there, you know, and so and people may be on this medication right now. There's a lot of people on it. So I just um, if you could just offer your wisdom there, that would be great. Sure. Um, so definitely don't try to stop this medication abruptly. And you should definitely talk to your doctor before, you know, changing a, a dose or anything like that. But I, I will also say that um, I have found that physicians are, um, as a rule, they're undereducated about this issue of deprescribing and um, tapering. So also before you are planning on embarking on a taper, I would do a lot of your own research because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of information to be found with our organization. And, um, like I said, Benzo buddies was a support website that I went to and found a lot of information. I mean, you always have to take some of that with a grain of salt, but I advocate not, not just, you know, it's good to keep your physician involved with the process, but also do your own research as well. You know, be your own self-advocate. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the stigma? There, there was a lot of, um, I read a lot about it on your website. And is that just people fear having this or, are, or feel sh ashamed when they have withdrawal like symptoms or chemical dependence, uh, or they don't know, or are they, do they get accused of maybe, I know there was a problem with, oh, they're pill shaming, but they're not. They're just sharing their experience and trying to find help. Um, yeah. So I think there's multiple sort of stigmas. I mean, there's a stigma of addiction where people are being stigmatized as being addicts, but they're really just experiencing um, physical dependence. Um, you know, and I, I had some of that in my own life where people were treating me, um, you know, as if I were suffering from addiction. And um, it really kind of gives you an appreciation for what people that truly are suffering from addiction, what they go through. Um, and then there's also the stigma of mental health. Like I was just treated as if I were um, experiencing anxiety and there was nothing wrong with me. And so that was, um, that also gave me appreciation of what people that are dealing with their mental health are as well. But then there's the other um, side of the equation, like you were mentioning, where people um, are speaking up about having an adverse event from their medication and then... <laughs> you know, they're, um, accused of being pill shamers. Cause I guess there's a segment of the population that, you know, when people take medications from, for their mental, mental health, you know, people are shaming them for taking those medications. And so, but uh, you know, that's not our intent at all, but for, by sharing these experiences, we're just trying to get people to, um, to know, you know, what are the potential risks? And I think really it's all about informed consent. Like people really know what they're getting into uh, before they take any sort of medication, basically. Right, right. Uh, just sharing every every story counts. Um, just trying to, no ulterior motives, just trying to share your story and uh, maybe provide someone else out there who is experiencing something similar. Like you said, when you first started to Google and read about similar experiences that was validating for you. Right. Right. I think that's important too. Um, one yeah. good, one good side of the internet anyways. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about what happened in September, 2020, I believe when it was, when the FDA put a black box warning on all of the benzodiazepines, I believe part of that was, uh, or included stressing that dependence can happen, even if you take the medication as prescribed. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Did it go far enough? Is it making a difference? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. So there actually was a black box warning put on benzodiazepines in 2016, but it was just for the combinations of benzodiazepines and opioids because that can cause respiratory depression and overdose. But then they went even further and updated it in 2020. Um, and they listed, um, addiction and abuse, um, which they said were more likely to occur in the context of poly substance abuse and then physical dependence and withdrawal reactions, which are more likely to occur in, with prescribed therapeutic use, which is, that's generally the population of um, patients that we follow. And, um, you know, I think overall the warning has been um, 
good. You know, I was speaking with some members of the FDA and they said none of this was new information, but they just really needed to um, to get it out there on the labels and to the prior benzodiazepine warning labels were kind of all over the map and they wanted to standardize um, the labels. One thing that they also mentioned I thought was interesting um, was the protracted withdrawal syndrome saying that you could have symptoms lasting 12 months or more um, after coming off a of benzodiazepine. Um, you know, they, in their literature, it looks like it's incredibly rare. I would say with what we're seeing, you know, Ashton said maybe 10 to 15% of people coming off long-term benzos might experience symptoms of protracted withdrawal. And I, I would say that's at least that many. Um, it's not quite as rare as I think that they let on. Because even today, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm still having symptoms, you know, three years out from benzodiazepines, even though I'm doing, you know, quite a lot better. Is there anything you're doing now that's helping you, uh, you, you know, I, I, you mentioned your blog, you started following like a really healthy diet, you, you lost a bunch of weight and uh, you started to feel better that way is, did you get into other types of lifestyle modifications that may have helped that stand out for you? Yeah. So um, mainly I've just been trying to follow a, you know, a decently healthy diet. I did keto at first for a, a few months. And then I kind of, after I'd lost some weight, I went back to just more of a, I just think, think a sensible diet with less processed food and no sugar, you know, things like that. Um, I try to get some regular exercise, you know, basically I'm just walking my dog. It's nothing super intense. Um, and then just, you know, working on my brain health. So I'm doing a lot of advocacy work I'm writing, um, you know, doing some research projects and I think just getting back to the daily activities of life, like the cooking and managing the household. I mean, all of that's just been really instrumental in regaining my health. Um, so I wouldn't say I've done anything super special. It's just kind of all the basic things, you know, special combination for you. <laughs> they all come together. <laughs> um, I wanted to get back to your, to Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. Uh, what are the main points or is there anything that you guys are really promoting now? If I went to your web, website, what kind of information would I get? Yeah, so on our website, you can find, you know, all sorts of information, just general information about benzodiazepines. Um, we've got a great document called Tapering Strategies and Solutions, which, um, you know, it's not super prescriptive and then it gives you exact details of how to get off but it just kind of reviews all the basic um, paper options that are available to you um, we have a pages a page of resources um, we have a, um, basically online support groups and um, specific articles that might be of use we also have a list of benzo wise doctors who can potentially help with a taper um, and we also have a list of our, um, you know, media projects that we've been involved in. You know, we've, you know, we put all sorts of information out there and, you know, been in multiple news articles and we have a YouTube channel. So, you know, there's just really a lot um, going on. And, you know, I would, I think in the last couple of years, I've, now that I've been feeling better, I've been able to get um, involved more in a, research projects and, and I'm working on writing my memoir. So there's just, you know, a lot going on. Very cool. You're writing a book. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And that's a good exercise for the brain too. Just, uh, um, outlining everything and holding yourself to a, a schedule to get, get things done. I wanted to ask you about the growth of your organization, because it looks like it's, it's grown a lot in the, in the last couple of years. Uh, that's just my perspective, having visited it early on. And then I think I bought a t-shirt at one time from you guys, um, which I still run in, by the way, it's a tank top. It's great. Um, but what, uh, are you, do you feel like it's growing? Are you getting more emails? Are more people coming there looking for help? Yeah, it's definitely grown. So it, the organization started in 2016 and I joined in 2017 and you know, I've just seen a lot of more awareness in the past few years. Um, just, I'm just trying to think so many things have happened. Um, we've had a little bit less media attention during 
COVID, but at the same time, I've been able to share my lived experience a lot more, um, you know, via Zoom. I can just, you know, go anywhere in the world at this point and tell my story. So that's been, you know, I think great for advocacy and awareness. Um, BIC, along with some other um, benzo organizations, were working with the um, Colorado Consortium's, um, what's it called, the Benzodiazepine Action work group and we're working on some projects for the state of Colorado to um, develop a benzodiazepine peer support curriculum and also hopefully prescriber education curriculum. Um, you know, I feel like prescriber education is one of those areas which still needs a lot of attention. And so we, you know, we have plans to continue working on that. So there's, there's really just a lot going on. And in sharing your personal story, have you found that the feedback has been mostly positive or yeah, critical, would, mostly positive? Yeah. And so it, I guess it depends on your audience. So if it's, you know, somebody that's gone through the similar issue, of course, they always um, respond pretty well. Um, you know, they're like, thank you for sharing this story. You know, it helps me to know that you, you got through this and that, you know, hopefully I can get through it one day too. Um, you know, occasionally we get the people that, think that we're trying to take their medications away, which is not, you know, not the case. A lot of the chronic pain patients are both, you know, opioids and, and um, medications for anxiety as well. And they think that our intent is just to say ban all benzos and nobody can have these drugs. And that, that's not it at all. We just, we want people to have the information and uh, realize that these medications are meant, you know, um, they haven't been studied for long-term use and they can have some long-term effects. And, and, and then, you know, if somebody is already on the medication, we, we definitely want to have the medication available for them either to continue if they're doing well on it or to, you know, do a long taper um, to come off the medication if needed. Um, so that's kind of our thoughts on that. I didn't know there was an acronym. I've been trying to say Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, but it, it's BIC. Yeah, we call it BIC. <laughs> That's a lot easier. Some people say BIC, I say BIC, but I think either's fine. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's a mouthful. I was, I was like, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna trip over this maybe once, maybe twice. We'll see. Christy Huff, Dr. Christy Huff, thank you so much. That was super informative. Thank you for sharing your story. And what is the website address if anybody out there is interested in learning more, or your even your social media handles? You can share those too. Yeah, sure. Um, so our website is benzoinfo.com and I'm on Twitter at Christy, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y, Huff, H-U-F-F-M-D, Christy Huff, M-D. That's right. I follow. And both our dogs were quiet. I oh. know. How, <laughs> how about that? All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Christy. And to the Trial Site News viewers, thank you for tuning in. Definitely check out her website and her writings because she's a really great writer.